This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. The heart longing of every Christian for the last 2,000 years has been to see the Saviour return and set up an everlasting kingdom on earth. Events in the world reveal that this will happen very soon. Keep listening to learn how you can spiritually prepare for Earth's final events. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return. Welcome, welcome to World's Last Chance Radio. I'm your host, Miles Roby, and today Dave Wright is going to be sharing with us some irrefutable facts and eye-opening scripture passages that prove the nature of Yahweh is one, not two, and certainly not three in one. What does that actually mean, to be honest? Three in one? No, it doesn't actually make much sense, does it? <laughs> no, not really, it doesn't. Um, not when you actually stop and just ponder it over. Well... That's the problem, isn't it? We're so used to projecting a certain perspective, a certain interpretation onto Scripture, that we overlook the most glaring truths that contradict the imposed error. We're so hyper-focused on this verse or that, which we can twist to prove our pet assumptions, that actually what happens is we miss the big picture. (laughs) In fact, Miles, it reminds me of a story that my family still laughs over. Okay, something you did to embarrass yourself and bring shame to the family name? Well, no, actually, not on this occasion. No, Um, This is my grandmother. It happened years before I was even born, but the incident has entered family law, and we still laugh about it. You see, what happened was my grandparents were driving, I can't remember exactly where, across country somewhere. All I know that it was a long trip, and something went wrong with the car. It was overheating or something. Who knows? I mean, this was a a good 60 to 70 years ago or so. So my grandfather pulls into the nearest service station that he sees. Now, this was back in the days before service stations expanded to sell drinks and snacks Mm. and magazines and all the stuff they do now. Yeah. So while the mechanic is working on the car, my grandmother gets bored. I'm sensing a potentially embarrassing situation right now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, and you would be absolutely right about that. Now, the thing you need to know about my grandmother is that she had very poor eyesight. You see, she had cataracts that left her virtually blind. And the only time that she could see something was when she used a large magnifying glass. But she didn't have her magnifying glass with her. It was too large to fit in her handbag, so it was with her luggage that was in the boot. However, she'd learned that if she curled her fingers over, she could form some sort of telescope with her hand and see things a little better. (laughs) Clever. I'll give her that. Yeah, well, now I want you to picture it, Okay, So here's this middle-aged lady, nicely dressed in dress, hat, gloves, heels, all those sort of things, how ladies dress back then, you know, the sort of thing. And she stuck in a service station, bored out of her mind, so she starts wandering around. Oh, did she she fall or something? No, 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 she was very careful, but something colourful catches her eye. There's something hanging on the wall, so she curls her fingers over into a scope, as I described, and she starts Mm. looking at what's hanging on the wall. Now, because she can only see clearly what's in the tiny hole left at the other end of her hand, she can't see much, so her face is up close, and she's carefully running her hand over it to see what it is, and all of a sudden, she jerks back, straightening up and with her face flaming turns and walks away hoping that nobody noticed that what she was actually so carefully going over centimeter by centimeter was a wall calendar with a very well endowed um scantily clad young woman in a shall we say sexy pose in the photo above that month's calendar <laughs> And, of course, someone someone saw or wouldn't have entered a family law, yeah? Absolutely right, yes. My grandfather thought it was hilarious, and he never let anyone forget the day that Mum got caught studying a girly calendar. (laughs) 
So that's the story. But this is the point that I wanted to make with it. She wasn't seeing the big picture. She had her fingers curled over, hand up to her eye, and she was carefully going over the picture, catching a detail here and a detail there, not mm. seeing what the full picture was because she was so focused on that tiny little bit revealed through the small hole formed by her fingers. And that's what we do as Christians. Christians are great, or maybe I should say terrible, at taking things out of context. Entire doctrines are built on one little verse here or one short passage there, but that's how we wander off into error too. Yeah, and if you, if you don't take all of, of, of Scripture into account, you can get way off, can't you? And I remember a couple of years ago uh, stumbling onto this one website where this extremely conservative Christian uh, was actually promoting polygamy because it appears in Scripture. He had all these articles where he was arguing a man should be able to have as many wives as he can afford to support. I mean, after all, it's biblical, isn't it? Was he a Mormon? Well, no. Okay, now, he was more the Jewish wannabe type. He was adamant that there was nothing wrong with polygamy since so many good people in Scripture were. Completely ignoring the passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that says a bishop, some translations say an overseer, must be above reproach and the husband of one wife. Mm. Or the text that says not to look at a woman to lust after her, because that's not what he wanted to hear. Well, that's what we're doing when it comes to the topic of the true nature of Yahuwah. You see, Scripture is so clear over and over again that there is only one God, one, and that's Yahuwah. He's not three in one, he's just one. Scripture is equally clear that the Son, Yahushua, is fully human, but that's not what we see when we go to the Bible because we're focusing on these scattered verses taken out of context that we can twist, if you like, to support our beliefs. So, what I'd like us to do today is to simply look at a collection of verses in the New Testament. When you combine all the evidence together, it's overwhelming that the Father and the Son are two separate entities. They're not one, they're not three in one, they are two and they are separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's, it's basic maths, isn't it? We all learned as kids. One plus one equals two. One plus one doesn't equal one, does exactly it? Exactly really? right, yes. Yeah. Well, there are quite a lot of them. So instead of asking you to look up every single verse, because that would just take too long, I've actually just printed them all off for you, one after the other. So there we are. Uh, that's the sheet or okay. sheets. Um, well, let's start with Matthew, and let's just okay. go right the way through. Because I think, Miles, that you will agree with me that the evidence is overwhelming. We've got to remember that the Bible writers, they had a full vocabulary. If they had wanted to express that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit were all one, they would have said so. Hold on a second, though, because I thought Yahushua did say that. Just uh, give me a second to find mm. it. It's John, uh, right before Christ's betrayal. And uh, it's here, it's John 17, verses 20 and 21, and it says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. This is talking about being united in purpose, not being united in divinity. You see, here Yahushua is saying that he prays that believers may be one. One in what? One in divinity? No. One in the Trinity? No. One in unity. That's very different from the oneness of the Trinity doctrine. There were 12 disciples and countless other believers. Now, let me ask you, were they all one? Only in purpose, not number. Exactly. All right. So the first verse on the sheet there, could you go ahead and read it for us, please? Okay, this is uh, Christ speaking to the mother of James and John after she'd asked that, uh, that, that they be given preferential treatment in Yah's kingdom. And it says in Matthew 20, verse 23, quote, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my father. So we've got a very clear distinction between the Father and the Son here. She asked for a favour that Yahushua couldn't grant. Clear difference between the Father and the Son. Mm. Okay? Yeah. Right, next one then. Okay. John uh, chapter 3, verse 16. 
For Hya so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Who gave? Yahuwah. Okay, Yahuwah gave. Yeah. So they aren't one and the same. Yahushua was the gift of Yahuwah to save a dying world. So what's the next verse say? John 3, 17. For Yah did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Okay, who sent Yahushua? Yahuwah. Did Yahuwah send himself? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so again, the two are separate entities. Certainly yeah. they're united in purpose, just as we are united with Yah when we work with him to save others, but still separate entities, not one and the same. Okay, yeah. now what's the next verse? Uh, John chapter 5, verses 36 to 38, and it says... I have testimony weightier than that of John for the works that the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I am doing testify that the Father has sent me and the Father who has sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. Again, it is the Father who does the act of sending, and he sends someone else. He doesn't send himself. Notice as well that there are two witnesses spoken of here. Yahushua and his works are a witness, but then it says in verse 37 that the Father himself is a witness. Again, hmm. separating the two as separate entities. Yeah, I, mean, I noticed that too as well, that it says that the Jews have never seen or heard the Father, and yet obviously... They're both seeing and hearing the sun in that very moment. So they couldn't have been one in the sense of a united triune Godhead. And, you know, that statement still be true. No, exactly right. You can't have it both ways, can you? No, no, no. Right, next verse. Okay, uh, this is verse 43 of the same chapter. And it says, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. Yahushua came in the Father's name. Yahuwah didn't come in his own name. Yahushua didn't come in his own name. Instead, he came in the name of the Father. Again, if we look at this verse with clear eyesight, untainted by the pagan doctrine of the Trinity, we can see that this verse only makes sense if it's describing two separate entities. Right, yeah, actually, it's amazing. We've kind of glossed over these glaringly clear statements before. Yeah. Um, next verse, by the way, is uh, John chapter 8, verse 18. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Again, two witnesses. Now, that's the whole point of this verse, that there are two witnesses. This has to do with the legalities of the ancient Israelite judicial system. Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 6 stated that a person could be put to death for a crime on the testimony of two or three witnesses, but no one was to be put to death based on the testimony of only one witness. Yeah, that was the same way for declaring the beginning of the new month, right? If, if two witnesses had seen the new moon, they were questioned by the high priests, and if their testimonies agreed, then the new month was then declared. Exactly right, yes. Statements were accepted as true based always on the testimony of two, not one, but two or more witnesses. The whole point of this verse is that Yahushua's testimony is true because he's got another witness to back him up, the Father. If they were truly one, as Trinitarians claim, he couldn't use the Father as his second witness. Hmm. So I've never thought of that before. Look here at literally the very next verse as well. John chapter 8, verse 19. It says, Then they asked him, Where is your father? Oh, rude, you know, their way of saying, Who's your dad, a boy? You know, have to rub it in. You know, they thought he was illegitimate. Anyway, going on, going on. You do not know me or my father, Yahushua replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Yahushua came to reveal the love of the Father, so if they'd known Yahushua, they would have known the Father. But that doesn't mean they're of the same substance as the Trinity doctrine teaches, and Yahushua is clear on that. You don't know me or my Father. Two separate entities. Okay, mm -hmm. what's next on the list there? Uh, it's John chapter 10, verse 25 to 30, and it says, Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. 
I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. All right, now there's a lot going on in this passage. We always yeah. focus on verse 30, I and the Father are one, but that has to be understood in the context of the verses that precede it. So let's actually just break this down, shall we? Mm-hmm. First, uh, verse 25, Yahushua yep. states the work that he does is in the Father's name. Now, that wouldn't be necessary to say if they were one in the Trinitarian sense. Mm-hmm. Next, in verse 29, he states that the Father, A, has given believers to him, and B, that the Father is greater than all. Right. Finally, he adds that no one can snatch believers out of whose hand? His hand? No, the Father's hand. Correct. You see, there are all these degrees of separation between Yahushua and the Father. So yeah. in that context, when he concludes by saying, I and the Father are one, he's not affirming a Trinitarian oneness. Instead, he's simply stating that they are one in their work to save souls, just as believers are one with the Father when we also work to save others. That doesn't make us divine. No, that point in verse 29, that the Father is greater than all, that would include Yahushua too, wouldn't it? That's an allness statement. It's an all-inclusive Yahuwah. He's greater than everyone else, including Yahushua. Such a statement would be absolutely incorrect if Yahushua and Yahuwah were one in the Trinitarian sense of being co-equal divine partners of a triune Godhead. And of the same substance as many Trinitarians believe. Right. You see, it's contradictory. Okay, mm. what's the next one? Uh, it's John chapter 12, verse 28. Okay, now this is where Yahushua was in the temple. In fact, Miles, uh, why don't you just read verse 29 there as well? Okay. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Now, you ask yourself, if the Father and the Son are one in the Trinitarian sense, did Yahushua pull a ventriloquist act here, answering his own question? You know, kind of like throw his voice or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to go with no on this one, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's ridiculous, isn't it, to think otherwise. Yeah. Right. Clearly, there are two different separate beings speaking here. To think otherwise is just to stretch credulity to the breaking point. Right, next, um, John 14, verse 1. Yeah, you can read that for us. Yeah, okay. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in Yah, believe also in me. You believe in Yahweh, believe also in me. He's saying, yeah. you believe in Yah, believe in me too, or mm-hmm. in addition. Now, let me ask you this. How can Yahushua be in addition to Yahweh if they're both one in the Trinitarian sense? Well, it just doesn't make sense, does it, though? No. Okay. Listen, further down the same chapter, John chapter 14, verse 25, anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Again, we've got two separate and distinct entities, the sender and the sent. Now, verse 28, you heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you love me, You would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. You can't get any clearer than this. The Father is greater than I. Now, if they were truly equal, co-divine partners, he couldn't say this, could he? Okay, well, but but what about the argument, right, that Yahushua laid aside his divinity when he took on humanity? I mean, could that be what he's talking about here? Okay, well, well, actually, that's a fair question, but that's not what it says. So you have to ask yourself why. If that's what's meant, why didn't he simply say so? He certainly had the vocabulary to express that thought. Yeah, it's true, that's true. This emphasis on the Father being a separate entity from the Son appears in Christ's parables too. Let's go to uh, John chapter 15, verses 1 and 2 there. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. If the Father and the Son were one in the Trinitarian sense, he'd use the royal we and say, we are the true vine and we are also the gardener. But he didn't say that, did he? 
Again, Yahushua didn't lack the vocabulary to express Trinitarian concepts, so you have to ask yourself, why didn't he teach that if it were the truth? Instead, all of these statements emphasize that the Father is greater than the Son and that they are two distinct separate beings. Mm. You can see that there are a few verses further on as well in 9 and 10, and it says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. So you've got these three separate entities here, the Father, Son, and the disciples. Okay, right. Now let's look at uh, verses 23 and 24. Whoever hates me hates my Father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my Father. Again, very clear separation between Father and Son. They have mm. hated both me and my Father. This is throughout the New Testament. Just go on to the next verse. It's John 16, verse 3, just a few verses later. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. Here, Yahushua is explaining the persecution his followers would face. If the Father and Son were one in the Trinitarian understanding, Yahushua wouldn't have made such a verbal divide. They haven't known the Father or me. Okay, what's next? Uh, John chapter 16, verse 32. A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. My Father is with me, not I am with myself. Yeah, it doesn't say that, this is it, really. Um, the truth really is all the way through, isn't it? You know, listen to this one. It's uh, a couple more verses on. It's John chapter 17, verse 1. And it says, After Yahushua said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. Yahushua is not praying to himself here, is he? He's praying to a separate being. Well, look at uh, verse 3 there. Now, this is eternal life. They that know you, the only true God, and Yahushua Christ, whom you have sent. Once again, two distinct personages, not one. Yeah, it's really interesting because this was just before Yahushua was betrayed in Gethsemane. Uh, like you said before, he certainly had the vocabulary to describe a triune relationship between himself and the Father, but instead he keeps emphasizing that they were separate entities. So listen to the next verse. It says, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Very different. Yahushua has completed the work the Father gave him to do. Basically, boss and workman, one superior, mm. the other's inferior. And yeah. you can't have that and a triune Godhead too. They are mutually exclusive. Yeah, it's amazing how it really is woven through the New Testament. Uh, listen, we're going to take a quick break, but let's keep going when we return. World's Last Chance has produced more than 1,500 documentaries in over 30 languages. Visit our website at worldslastchance.com or look for WLC videos on YouTube. New documentaries on a variety of important topics are being released all the time. Start watching now and learn the truth while you still have the chance at worldslastchance.com. For those just tuning in, Dave has been taking us through the New Testament, showing us how Yahushua repeatedly emphasised his separateness from the Father, his inferior position to the Father. And not just Yahushua, the other New Testament writers were clear on this as well. They didn't believe Yahushua was equal to Yahuwah because they were strict Unitarians. The Trinity heresy wouldn't be adopted, remember, for another 300 years. So let's turn to Acts chapter 2. This is Peter's sermon on Pentecost, and what is it he says in verse 24? But Yahuwah raised him, Yahushua, from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. In this verse, two different, separate individuals are presented. One is dead, the other is alive. They clearly can't be one and the same. That's true, that's true. You know, this is one of the clearest proofs of the humanity of Christ. Divinity cannot die. And to say that his divinity didn't die, only his humanity died, is to say he didn't die at all. You take off the blinders of error and it all becomes so clear, doesn't it? It really does. 
Okay, let's just keep going on Peter's sermon here. Now, next, he's going to be quoting David. Can you just read there verses 26 and 27? Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. Two people are again being spoken of here. One knows he's going to die and is trusting that he won't be left to stay dead. The other is the one who raises him from the dead. They can't be the same entity as one is clearly dead and the other, the one who raises him from the dead. Very different. OK, what's next? Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. Paul, a servant of Christ, Yahushua, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of Yah, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David. This would have been the perfect place to establish Christ's divinity as having a pre-existence, but Paul doesn't say that. Instead, he says Yahushua is a descendant of David. And in verse 3, when he says regarding his son, we've again got two separate individuals there, father and son, two, not one. Okay, next. Um, Galatians chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, an apostle, sent neither by human commission nor from human authorities, but through Yahushua Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Two people, Christ and the Father who raised him from the dead. You know, when, when you take it, as it just as it reads, it's clear there's really a, a difference here, isn't it? You know, so we're, we're so used to glossing over that. But God, using the Trinitarian umbrella term, clearly doesn't resurrect himself here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 23 is next. Okay. Um, Peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Yahushua Christ. If they were both co-equal members of a triune Godhead, he would simply have said, from God. But he didn't. He added that little connector, and God the Father and the Lord Yahushua Christ. Philippians 1 verse 2, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Yahushua Christ. Two individuals connected by that little word, and. Connected because they're not the same entity. All right, now what does Colossians chapter 1 verse 1 say? Paul, an apostle of Christ Yahushua, by the will of God and Timothy our brother. Now we've got four people mentioned here by name. Paul, mm. Yahushua, Yahweh and Timothy. Uh -huh. Read First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 1 now. This is another opening salutation. Now Paul had plenty of opportunities to teach a triune divine nature, but what he keeps repeating in letter after letter is the separateness of father and son. Okay, verse 1. Uh, Paul, Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Yahushua Christ. Grace and peace to you. In his second letter to the Thessalonians, Paul repeats this same separation, emphasizing the unitarian nature of Yah. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Yahushua Christ. Notice once again the connector and. And, yeah. Let's now see what Paul says to Timothy. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And if there are any connectors, I'd like you to emphasize them. Mm-hmm. Paul, an apostle of Christ Yahushua, by the command of God our Saviour and of Christ Yahushua our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Yahushua our Lord. Clearly not the same being or he wouldn't have had to say and. and now yeah. what does he say in his next letter to Timothy? First Timothy chapter 1 verse 2. I'll emphasize again, grace and peace from Yahuwah the Father and from Yahushua our Saviour. He phrases it a bit differently in Titus. Can you just read that one there from Titus chapter 1 verse 1? Okay. Paul, a servant of Yah and an apostle of Yahushua Christ. Now, I know this is probably starting to feel a bit redundant, but that's the <laughs> yeah. point. Over and over and over again. Christ himself, as well as the New Testament writers, emphasised the difference and separation between the Father and the Son, not their oneness. In fact, about the only place it talks about their oneness is John 17, where it's speaking of oneness in purpose and includes believers in that oneness. 
OK, Philemon. This is Paul's letter to Philemon, and it's very short. It's only one chapter. And from that, can you just read that verse there, verse 3? Grace and peace to you from... Two people here. God our Father. That's one. And... And the Lord Yahushua Christ. That's two. The author of Hebrews says it a bit differently. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the past, Yahuwah spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. In the past, Yahuwah spoke by prophets. Now, does that make the prophets divine? Uh, well, no. Now he speaks by his son. This statement makes absolutely no sense whatsoever if father and son were part of the same Godhead. I notice as well that Yahuwah appointed Yahushua heir of all things like earlier. This presets Yahuwah as superior to Yahushua. Yes, clearly they're not on the same level. What does the Apostle James say in James chapter 1 verse 1? Um, James, a servant of Yah, and, that, that's the connector there again, of the Lord Yahushua Christ. Now what about Second Peter chapter 1 verses 1 and 2? Okay. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Yahushua Christ, to those who, through the righteousness of our God and Saviour Yahushua Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of Yahuwah and of Yahushua our Lord. There's no combining the two into one in Peter's theology. They're two separate individuals. Of all the apostles, John the Beloved can arguably said to have been the closest to Yahushua. If anyone understood the nature of Yahushua as relates to Yahuwah, it would be him. So, let's see what John had to say on this. Next reference is 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Yahushua Christ. Our fellowship is with the Father and and with his Son. Two separate persons, not one. And this same understanding appears in the second chapter of 1 John. Read verse 1 of that, please. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Yahushua Christ, the Righteous One. To use Trinitarian terminology, God is not our advocate. Remember, if the Father is God and the Son is also God, then we've got a conflict because 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 clearly states that we have an advocate with God. And who is it? God? He advocates with himself for us? No. <laughs> well, no, no. It's, it's Yahushua. As we've seen in all the other verses, it holds true here. Yahweh is our one and only God, not Yahushua. He's our advocate, but he's not also God. Mm. This division appears in 2 John as well. Could you just read from that list there? Uh, 2 John chapter 1, verse 9. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have Yah. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Now, if the Father is God, and he is, and if the Son is also God, and we know he's not, then why would John describe God as both the Father and the Son? Doesn't work, does it? No, it's ridiculous. John viewed the Father and the Son as two separate individuals. One's divine, and the other is human. One is God, and the other is our advocate with God. Two separate beings with two separate roles. All right, let's take a look at what Jude has to say. Now, Jude, again, very short book, just one chapter, and let's start with verse 1. Uh, Jude, a servant of Yahushua Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Yahushua Christ. If Yahushua is God, as we've always been taught, why didn't he just say, to those who have been called, who are loved and kept for God? Mm, that would make more sense. But Jude didn't say that. He separated them. They're loved in God the Father and kept for Yahushua. Okay, what does verse 4 say? For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. 
They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Yahushua Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. There's that connector again. And linking our God with Yahushua Christ. You wouldn't need to link them if they were both God. All right, now we've gone through the whole of the New Testament now. There's only the book of Revelation left, and it has more references to Yahuwah and Yahushua being separate individuals than any other book save one, and that's the Gospel of John. But then, of course, John wrote them both. So let's just jump in here. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, and it says, The revelation which God gave to himself, right? No, 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 no. The revelation from Yahushua Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Two people, two separate individuals. Now let's read verses 4 and 5. This is John's greeting to his intended audience. And notice that he's including others, saying the greeting is from them as well. Okay. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Yahushua Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So let's count this up. The greeting is from John, of course. Who else? Um, him who is, and was, and is to come. So Yahuwah, who else? Uh, the seven spirits before his throne. And? And Yahushua. It's, it's actually interesting that Yahushua here is listed after the seven spirits before his throne. Yahuwah is God. He is the only true and living God. If, as Trinitarians teach, Yahushua is also God, he wouldn't need to be listed separately, and he likely wouldn't appear last in the list. Now, there's more division. Read verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Yahushua, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of Yahuwah and the testimony of Yahushua. Again, and I know that I'm starting to sound here like a broken record. Father and the Son are not one and the same. They're presented as separate individuals. Mm -hmm. I used that expression with one of my kids the other day, actually sounding like a broken record. And uh, he looked at me and said, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, maybe we should say sounding like a scratch CD or something. Or a glitchy download that doesn't quite <laughs> yes. work, does it? Really? It's not got the same kind of feel. No, no, not the same at all. <laughs> anyway, getting back on track. Uh, what does Revelation chapter 2 verse 8 say? To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. Here, a name isn't even used. It's just a description. But it's clear the description is of... Yahushua. Right, yes. He's the only one who died and came to life again. And because it's impossible for God to die, we can know that Yahushua is not one and the same entity as the Father. This is a big proof right here that Yahushua is fully human. Divinity cannot die. Trinitarians try and wriggle around that by saying that only Yahushua's humanity died, his divine nature did not actually die. But then that would mean he didn't truly die, wouldn't it? Precisely. And it's back to stretching credulity to the breaking point. Okay, now what's next? Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 to 27. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. Here again is the same dynamic we've seen presented throughout the New Testament. The lesser receives power and authority from the greater, proving that Yahuwah and Yahushua are not co-equal partners in a triune Godhead. Let me just ask this before we go on. Yeah. What about the passage in Paul where, let me just read it here, it's Philippians 2 verses 5 to 8, and it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Yahushua, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God and made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. In a previous program, we've discussed what this passage is really saying and how it can be used to prove a pre-existence for Christ. 
But your question actually there, Mars, it's a little different. Now, you're wanting to know if this teaches equality between the Father and the Son, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the very next verse answers your question. Just read verse 9. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. If they were co-equal partners, Yahuwah could not truly be said to be exalting Yahushua. It would all be play-acting. And that's what Trinitarians are teaching when they try to divide Yahushua into a human part and a divine part. Actually, I saw a meme online that pointed out this very discrepancy. Now, to believers, this is going to sound shocking and maybe even a little sacrilegious, but just bear with me because it points out okay. the glaring fallacy in the Trinitarian doctrine like little else. Okay, what is it then? Well, it said in quotes, Jesus died for our sins. And then below that it says, except he didn't actually stay dead. So what did he sacrifice? His weekend? Jesus gave up his weekend for your sins. Oh, yeah, th that's quite funny and awful at the same time. But I think you'll agree, it does make a valid point if you it believe does, yeah, yeah. that Yahushua is God too, because divinity can't die. Then if his supposed divinity didn't die, did he actually die at all? You can't have it both ways. He either mm. died for us or he didn't. But in order to die, he had to have been fully human. And as we saw in our first segment today, Christ's own words always put himself as subservient to the Father. This was not a play-acting role. This is how it really is. Yeah, the next verse makes it quite clear too. Listen to this, Revelation 3 verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. If Yahushua is God, why would he be confessing the names of the overcomers before the Father? Is he saying it to himself? <laughs> yes, a good point. <laughs> uh, just read uh, verse 12. Okay. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. The distinction between God, Yahuwah, and Yahushua could not be more clear. He didn't say, he who overcomes, I will make a pillar in my temple and write my name on him. Instead, he differentiates between the name of his God and his own name, clearly stating that both the temple and the city belong to his God. Read verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Can Yahushua be the beginning of the creation of God and still be God like the Trinity doctrine teaches? Well, not hardly. Verse 21. To him who overcomes I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Two different individuals, two different thrones, and the biggest difference is that Yahweh's throne is his, because, well, he's God. Yahushua's throne is his reward for overcoming, not his by right of being God. Yeah, huge difference. Uh, next passage is Revelation chapter 4, verse 2 to 11. And it says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. You know what? I, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, but we're going to run out of time here. Just go ahead and, and, and give the next text again so that those at home can actually look it up for themselves. Okay, right. It's uh, Revelation 4, verses 2 to 11. All right, so here John is in vision. He's describing the throne room of heaven. The one sitting on the throne is Yahuwah, or God. Now, Yahushua is not God, and he's not sitting on the throne. Instead, in the next chapter, and I think that's next on your list, isn't it? It is, yeah. Okay, the throne room scene, begun in Revelation chapter 4, continues in Revelation chapter 5, and Yahushua is here symbolized as a lamb standing before the throne. Again, he's an entirely separate entity. He's not God. God isn't both sitting on the throne and at the same time standing in front of it. <laughs> okay, so what's next? Well, before we go on, I just want to point out that in verse 13 of Revelation 5, all the holy beings in the throne room say, Blessing and honour and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb for ever and ever. 
they're singing praise, aren't they? You know, to the one on the throne and to the Lamb. Again, a differentiation is is made. Yes, very good. Yes. Okay. What's next? Uh, Revelation chapter eleven, verse fifteen. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Lord, as we've said many times before. Now, this is simply a title. This can be a little bit confusing, because throughout the New Testament, it's frequently used to refer to Yahushua. But here, in this context, it's clearly referring to Yahuwah, because the very next phrase says, And of his Christ. Yet Mm. again, Two individuals, not one. Next is Revelation 12, verse 17. It says, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yahushua Christ. If Yahuwah and Yahushua were both one in the Trinitarian sense, if they were both God, this would simply say those who keep the commandments and have the testimony of God. But that's not what it says. It says the commandments of God and the testimony of Yahushua. The next passage is Revelation 14, verses 1, 4, and 12. It says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yahushua. So again, same thing, a clear distinction between God, a title that refers to Yahuwah alone, and Yahushua. They are not one and the same. They're different, separate. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Revelation 15, verse 3. This is describing the 144,000. It says, They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvellous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. There are three different persons being named here. There's Moses, that's one. Who's the servant of God? That's two. And the Lamb, that's three. Yeah. Can we really keep insisting that Yahweh and Yahushua are both God when Scripture repeatedly differentiates between the two? Now, I know we're almost out of time, so just write down the next one if anyone would like to read it for themselves. It's Revelation... Uh, Revelation 19, 5 to 7. Okay, just read through that and you will see that it lists four different parties. There's Yahweh, the Almighty, the Lamb, who's also Yahushua, the Bridegroom. There's also the Bride of the Lamb. And finally, there's a great multitude... The bride is the bride of the Lamb, not the bride of God. Okay, what's next? Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Okay, if Christ is God, why does it list him separately here? Why doesn't it simply say they shall be priests of God? Uh, Which is a good question, to be honest. Uh, Revelation 21, verses 9 and 10. Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Three different individuals, the bride, the lamb, and Yah. Verse 22. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the lamb are its temple. Two parties, the Lord God Almighty, who could only be Yahweh, and the lamb. Right, super quickly, Revelation 22, verses 1 and 3. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Now that's the very last chapter of the Bible. We've gone literally the whole way through the New Testament, and over and over, what have we found? Yahweh and Yahushua are presented as two distinct and separate individuals. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 93.30 kHz on the 31 metre band. 
World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Do you have a secret desire, a hidden longing for something you don't have? The Heavenly Father does. The yearning of Yahweh's heart has always been to have an intimate, loving friendship with his creatures. That was his plan at creation, and it is still the deepest desire of his heart. Very few people have any concept of just how much Yahuwah misses their company, but he does. He misses you. Sin disrupted the close relationship between creator and creature, but the plan of salvation will, ultimately, restore mankind to oneness with their maker. If you would like to know more, look for His Temple with Men, The Secret Longing of the Father's Heart on worldslastchance.com or on YouTube. Yahuwah is lonely for you. Read, watch or listen to His Temple with Men and see how very much you are loved. Hello, this is Jane Lamb with today's Daily Promise from Yah's Word. Life is getting really intense. Let's be honest, life's never easy. But the last few years, with a pandemic, lockdowns, loss of income for many due to lockdowns, the resulting economic impact and the ever-increasing political instability with growing threat of war, life is more intense than ever before. For believers, there is the added stress of following truth when cherished church and social relations, maybe even spouse, parents or children, don't follow truth too. If you're feeling afraid or overwhelmed, if you're waking up in the middle of the night racked with anxiety, be assured that Yahuwah is still in control and he is watching over you, your loved ones and your situation with a love that will never let you go. Joshua 1 verse 9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for Yahuwah your God will be with you wherever you go. Yahuwah is our God, the only true and living God. No matter what happens in life, his eye is upon you and he will carry you through. We have been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. Scripture presents God as being only one. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 declares, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. And that's what the early Christians believed for hundreds of years, until in the 4th century they started making compromises with paganism. There is Yahweh, the only living, self-existent God, and there is Yahushua, his only begotten human son, who was born to be the Lamb of Yah that died for the sins of the world, Two distinct individuals, one divine and the other human. But when you try and combine these two distinct individuals into one, saying they're both God, you have to take things out of context, ignore clear biblical statements, and twist logic to try to make truth and error fit, and it just doesn't. Truth Mm. is logical, error isn't. Yeah, it's like trying to say that one plus one equals one. It just doesn't fit. It's illogical. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy, All scripture is given by inspiration of Yahuwah and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Yah may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Scripture was given to us, the common man. 
We're to take Scripture just as it reads. You don't need to be a Bible scholar. It was the scholars, the so-called church fathers, that corrupted and contorted Scripture to begin with in their attempt to work in platonic ideas. Let's determine, each one of us, to set aside these wrong ideas and worship Yahweh, the only being who alone is God. Let's be grateful that He begat a Son to save us from our sins, but let's not commit idolatry by exalting that son to a position that he never claimed for himself. Not only that Yahushua never claimed for himself, but which scripture clearly does not teach. For those of you who may have missed some of our earlier programs, you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute. 1 John chapter 5, 7 and 8 teaches a trying Godhead. But let me That's just, the just... verse that says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Right, thanks, Dave. For those of you thinking that this passage teaches a trinity, you're right, it does. Thing is, John didn't write it. It doesn't appear in any of the early manuscripts. In fact, it wasn't added until over a thousand years after Christ. So, Dave is right. Scripture teaches that God, Yahuwah, is just one being, not two and certainly not three. But I have to admit, Dave, I am really shocked that the sheer number of verses that make this clear all three in one. All it takes is accepting Scripture just as it reads and not imposing our own interpretation on it. Mm -hmm. May Yahuwah bless us with clear discernment to know when we're in danger of doing that. Amen. Our time is up today, but we want to thank you for joining us. I hope you can tune in again tomorrow. And until then, remember, Yahuwah loves you and he is safe to trust. listening to WLC Radio. World's Last Chance is committed to bringing the gospel of the Kingdom of Yah to the world. Prophecy and current events indicate the Saviour will return in the very near future. This will be followed by gifting the saints with immortality and setting up Yah's kingdom here on earth. There's no time to waste. Accept the gift of salvation today and allow Yahweh to cover you with the righteousness of Christ. This programme, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available on our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the homepage. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 metre band. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return. <laughs>